very few people actually believe this story. I believe it's the Word of God. I believe this story. But very few people in the Christian church today believe that this is to be taken literal. And that it happened. Now, some people say that uh, it's just too much to swallow. (laughs) No. (laughs) I'm serious. <laughs> the other thing is like I was telling pastor, you know how fi- you know how fishermen are. They catch a fish this big and then they they tell John and it's this big and, then, <laughs> and it keeps getting bigger. <laughs> I never seen a fish like that. <clears throat> All right, enough fooling around. Uh, Jonah chapter 1. Jonah is Actually, quite interesting because if you think about it, who's the, who's the greatest person in the Bible? Well, be Jesus. Jesus. But it, it is a representation because the belly of the whale three days. Yeah, we're going to look at that. that. That's what I love about Jonah. Really. Oh yeah, and we're, yeah, we'll get, we'll get into that. That's not in, uh, until we finish the uh, first chapter here. But um, Jesus talked about or referred to four prophets of the Old Testament. That's all. Anybody? Can anybody name them? The pastor just gave you one. So there's three more that Jesus talked about. Moses, Isaiah, Well, when I say prophets, it, it's in the time of the prophets. So obviously he talked about Moses. I'm not, I'm not counting Moses, but... So out of the, out of the prophets, and you know, so after the kingdom was set up, so Elijah was mentioned. Elisha was mentioned. Yeah, Jonah was mentioned. Who was the other guy? No, it's not Noah though. Oh, Isaiah. Isaiah. So, you remember how we said um, before in, in previous messages how when you find a group like this, there, there's a reason that there, you know, God isolated four and put them together. And if you think about the caliber, Isaiah, we said last, I think a couple of weeks ago or something, Isaiah was actually sawed in half. Isaiah wrote one of the largest books, the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters. It's incredible, incredible prophecy. And of course, the, uh, the professors and the, the skeptics out there, they, they don't believe that it was one Isaiah. They, they believe it's two or three guys by the name of Isaiah. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Isaiah was the one who wrote the whole book. He's, there's only one Isaiah. <clears throat> and uh, he's a great, great man. And then when you think about Elisha and Elijah, all the great miracles that were first done at Elisha. And here's something interesting. You know, Elisha's prayer was that God would give him a double portion. Did you know that Elisha did exactly twice as many miracles as Elijah? That's double portion. Yeah. Right? That's tremendous. And so this is the company. So you got Isaiah, Isaiah, Elisha, Elijah, and then Jonah. Which people, you know, when you mention Jonah, it's like you know, like they're tongue in cheek, you know, like people because people just don't believe this story. They say, "Oh, well, that's just a myth, a Hebrew myth." Well, I don't believe that. I believe that Jonah, that this story is as literal and accurate as it says here, and that Jonah actually had wrote this book because I don't see how anybody could have wrote the book because how would they know all this stuff happened? So anyway, Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amiti, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness is come up before me. Well, that sounds kind of familiar, right? Going to all the world, preach to God. You know, it's kind of this is the grand, great commission, right? 
but this is in the Old Testament, and this is highly unusual for a prophet to be sent out of Israel to go preach to a, another nation, which was about, I think it's over 550 miles away from uh, Jerusalem. It would have been, it would have taken him at least a month to get there for Jonah to get to Nineveh. Anybody know where Nineveh was located? Okay, well, it's not in Europe. You know where, do you, do you know where Iraq is? Okay, Iraq has two rivers going up. One is the, that famous Euphrates River goes up this way, and then the other one is the Tigris River, and it goes up this way, and right there on the Tigris River, on the right side, uh, at north, uh, northern Iraq, is where the city of Nineveh was. And Nineveh was an, an amazing city. It had 600, was it 650? 50,000 people living there. That's huge. And it was at the perimeter of the city was 60 miles. And it had two walls, like a fortress, that surrounded the whole city. The inner wall and the outer wall. And on the inner, I think it was the inner wall, was uh, 50, 50 feet wide. It was a, The walls were 100 feet high and three chariots could run along the top there to patrol it just to show how huge this was for the 650 if you got 650,000 people that's going to take a lot of food and water right and your enemy what enemy a lot of times what the enemy would do they would surround the camp and they would starve the people out because they had to go out to eat they have to get the food Nineveh had all the farming inside the city. So it was almost impregnable, just so you realize that. And there's a reason, and we're going to see, Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to preach to Nineveh because that is their number one enemy. Jonah started his, his ministry was to the northern part of Israel. I don't know if you remember, but after... We talked about David and, and Solomon. After Solomon, the, the, two, the nation Israel was divided. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There was the northern ten tribes and the, and the southern uh, had two tribes. And um, the Levites were in both, by the way. But um, he came out of uh, the northern part of Israel. He was contemporary with Hosea and Amos. And then there's another prophet that talks about Nineveh about 100 years or so, maybe 150 years after. So anyway, so God tells him in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And I described how great this city was. And cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now you would think that all the nations throughout the world are wicked, right? So why is this, this, this one more important than the rest? Well, I think the whole thing was that God was going to use this situation to bury within these four chapters a terrific, terrific prophecy. <clears throat> uh, verse 3, But Jonah, he rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, does anybody know where uh, Tarshish, the, their place called Tarshish, anybody got, know where that was? Tarshish was located, it's believed, now nobody really knows, because there's not this place called Tarshish. In our day, there, we, there's no there's no historical documents or or even maps. Some people think Tarshish was that lost city of Atlantis that sunk underneath the water, and I don't know if that's a true story or not. Well, it's a story. I don't know if it's true or not about Atlantis. But do you know where Gibraltar is? Gibraltar is the, at the bottom of Spain. That little there's a little country down there. The Rock of Gibraltar, and, and when uh, the ships 
go out of the Mediterranean Sea, they go through the, the Strait of Gibraltar to get into the ocean. So there's a lot of people that think that Tarshish, by that they meant Gibraltar, but th- that's not true. What they meant was it's from some great distant land. These ships, these great ships would come in from the ocean and they would come in through that strait of Gibraltar and come into the Mediterranean Sea and they would bring all their stuff. So, now we just got through saying Nineveh is, if you're in Israel, to get to Nineveh, you go north and then you go uh, east. Right? Because it's above Iraq. So what does Jonah do? He turns around. He goes completely in the wrong, in the, in the different direction. God says, "Go northeast." He goes southwest. He's trying to get as far away from God, you know, command as he can. Why? Because he don't want to go. Have you ever known people like that? I mean, God, you know, they they, they say they. You know, they accept Christ and then all of a sudden God starts dealing with them and they want to run. They don't want to do what God told them to do. And they're afraid. And you know, I don't know if he was afraid. He may have been afraid because Nineveh had a reputation. They they were, it was the 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 capital of the Assyrian Empire. They're actually the ones who later on destroy the northern nation of Israel there. But they were they were really evil. Evil people. Torture and, and all the kind of things that anything that, that you would think that was so evil. Now the best way to describe it, rent a copy of Veggie Tales. And in Veggie Tales they did a thing about Jonah. And you, it shows how nasty the people were because they would take a fish and hit somebody right across the face with a live fish. I mean, you can't get worse than that, right? You, I'm not kidding. It's so funny. It's so funny, especially if you know the story. But they did, you know, they did worse than that in, in, uh, in Nineveh. These were some really rotten people. And knowing what we know now, that this is the same nation that would come back and destroy Israel after God. Because if you, if you don't know, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag here. Nineveh actually repents. Okay, when we get into the third chapter, Nineveh actually repents from, from the message that Jonah uh, brought to them. So uh, so God spares them. And then about 100 years, 150 years, 100 years later, they come back and they destroy God's people. <laughs> and they, they, if you ever you heard of the lost tribes of Israel, that comes from this idea that when the Assyrian Empire took over the northern part of Israel, they were unlike any other uh, kind of um, any other nation at that time, any other empire, because other ones would like keep the people together and make slaves out of them. And and but the Assyrians, they scattered them all over, so that they could so they wouldn't bond together from their ethical or ethnical um, culture. And they wouldn't say, you know, I'm a Jew. or I, And that's why they say that the, the, these ones who went into the Assyrian captivity, they had completely lost their identity because they didn't, they separated them throughout the whole empire. And it was, it was the most glorious empire at the time. It was before Babylon rose up, by the way. So anyway, that kind of gives you uh, some idea. So uh, Jonah is sent to Nineveh, but he turns around and goes completely the other way. He goes down to Joppa. Now, does anybody know where Joppa is? No. I'll give you a hint. It's the capital of Israel that most people say is the capital of Israel. Except for Donald Trump says Jerusalem. No, Jerusalem. Donald Trump says Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. But everybody else counts in another place. What is it? Tel Aviv. Okay, so right there at Tel Aviv is where Joppa was. Okay. And if you've ever seen uh, uh, the movie Clash of the Titans, that was in Joppa also. 
but we're talking about Greek mythology there. But it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous movie. That's where the, that Gorgon monster comes up. Or what do you release the kraken? That's what they said in a release the kraken. Okay, so that's where Joppa is. So he's trying to get away completely 100 percent in the in the other direction, 180 degrees in the other direction. So we get into verse four here. Um, verse three it says that he paid the fare, he went, he found the ship, and it was going to Tarshish. And he it says he was went he went with them to uh, to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And what we were saying about Tarshish, we don't know where Tarshish was, so he was planning on leaving outside Gibraltar there and going wherever they they come from, these ships come from. And there's people that, that believe that these ships actually came from all the way from uh, uh, England, and they would come down. Now, not everybody believes that. Most people believe that Tarshish was, was somewhere, somewhere there in maybe Spain or... So anyway, but um, so that gives you some some break background there. Jonah chapter one verse four. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Now this is not uncommon in the Mediterranean Sea. In fact. Uh, a similar thing happened in Jesus' day in Galilee. If you remember, there, the apostles cried out. There was this great tempest storm while they were in the boat. And they said, Lord, save us, remember? And Jesus was just sleeping. <clears throat> and uh, then he said, oh, ye of little faith. Remember that story? But this was common in that, in that uh, uh, Mediterranean. But people who traveled in ships like this, they were kind of used to storms at sea. So this must have really been, what's that word, the humdinger? <laughs> if you've ever heard, the humdinger, right? It was a, it was a great, great. Um, in fact, it's supernatural because you see, it said the Lord sent out a great wind. So this is not just, you know, the east wind or the north wind. or This is something that God sent out, and, and I would actually call it, um, I would say that this is a miracle. God is actually doing a miracle, supernaturally sending this storm. In fact, we'll see in this, if I don't forget to, to, to bring them up as we go through, there's actually ten miracles in this book. You didn't think there would be ten miracles in the book of Jonah, right? Which most people won't even read because they think it's a fairy tale. But it's not. I promise you, it's not. Uh, uh, if, if it is a fairy tale, Jesus certainly didn't know it. Jonah chapter 1, verse 5. Then the, the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God. And of course, back then, everybody, you know, most people did call upon a God. Today, a lot of people don't even have a God so the mariners were afraid. They cried, "Every man unto his God." They cast forth the wares that were in the ship, uh, were in the ship into the sea. In other words, they were trying to cast out anything that they could. And that may remind you of when Paul, uh, right before Paul got shipwrecked, they were trying to do the same thing to unload everything to, because they were in a great storm. And it was actually in the Mediterranean as well. So, so they, they threw all this, these wares out of the ship to lighten it of them, says. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. And it kind of reminds us of Jesus. He's in this great, great storm, and he doesn't even know it because he's, he's asleep. He's, he's thinking, I finally got away from God. Right? And he's sleeping. He went down. And another th- another phrase, it says Jonah went down. He says Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. You'll notice as we go through Jonah, there's a lot of references about going down. Especially when he goes down in the fish. All right? But there's a lot of going down. Go down, down. And I think it's, it symbolizes uh, the um, him trying to get away from God to... Um, yeah, because he's... You flee from God there. So anyways, so verse 6. So the shipmaster came to Jonah and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. So 
they don't care what God you call upon. Just call upon your God. Right? And I've noticed something. People out there in the world, now this is not true of Christians, but people out there in the world, when something happens, they don't care what God you pray with. <laughs> right? I mean, if you work with a Muslim, the Muslim says, well, you know, we'll pray for you. Oh, thank God. You know, thank you for praying. So I'm going to pray to Allah. Oh, I'll pray to Krishna. I'll pray. I don't want that. If you're going to pray, pray to the right God. What good is praying to the devil going to do, right? So anyway, but, but this is before they, this, this comes from the world, so. So anyway, so they, they say, call upon your God, uh, or upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. So they were afraid they were all going to die. So verse 7 says, and they said, every one to his fellow, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. Now, casting lots is something that they did in the Bible a lot. Okay, Bible records that many times. And that's to, uh, I'll give you an example. If you take, if, if every one of us had a, like a poker chip, you know what a poker chip is? You, know, you got a green one and a blue one and a red one. Yes, I think those are the standard colors. And then, uh, or, or blue, red, and white. And then you could have, you could have other ones, right? Green, purple, whatever. So what if all, each one of us had a poker chip and we were going to pick somebody to do some specific function. So you all put your chip in a, ba- a brown bag and I shake them up and somebody picks it and the purple one was picked. Well, whoever had the purple one, they're the one, right? They're the one. So that would be kind of like casting lots. I don't know exactly what a lot was. I think there were, were different lots. Obviously it was done historically and even into the New Testament. And I'll give you uh, uh, eight, eight places where um, lots were, were actually used for determining the will of God. Okay? So, one was, do you remember when they went into Jericho? The Israelites went into Jericho and they, they tore down the city, right? And God said, don't take anything. And there was one guy that stole something. And the next time they went into battle to to Ai, the city of Ai, it was terrible. The results were terrible because God wouldn't bless the situation because there was sin in the camp. And sometimes we wonder how, you know, how come things are the way they are? Well, maybe the church needs to start getting rid of sin in the camp. Maybe think, you know, we read the Bible and the Bible says that we should be healed and we should be prosperous and we should, we should have all these things, but how come, how come not everybody is? Well, maybe it's because there's sin in the camp. Maybe it's sin in your life. Maybe it's sin in, in just in, in, in the church, period. Maybe the, the blessings of God would just overflow upon us if we would all mature and get, get right with God. And I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. That's it's possible. But um, so they, the way they determined who was guilty was casting lots. They cast. You know, they might, they probably started with uh, they t- started with a lot for each tribe. There were twelve tribes, and then the lot for which other I don't remember what, what tribe uh, Aiken was, but that tribe came up, and then you know, and they just went through the families. And, and all the way down to Achan. And that was very biblical. Now, if they were going to, if, 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 if the, just us who are here, present, uh, were taken away by some criminals or something, and they said, someone must die for whatever. And you know you're innocent, right? But one of us did it. One of us did what they're really angry about. So it's like, I don't know if you ever heard of Sopranos. So the Sopranos got gotcha. you. You know, Sopranos were the, the uh, organized crime. A movie, a uh, series on HBO. So anyway, they, they put all of our names into a paper bag. And they say, okay, whoever we pick out of the paper bag, that's the one that's guilty. How comfortable would you be with that? <laughs> 
That's what they're. That's what they did to Achan. And they and actually God blessed it. He pointed out the the guy that did it, and then he confessed he did it, right? But this is what they're doing to, to Jonah. They're saying we're going to find out who's the guilty one. We're going to look at all the people in the ship. And if you're on the ship, you're thinking, what if the lot shows me I'm completely innocent? What were they trying to get them for? Guilty of what? Well, why was the storm coming against the ship of Jonah that Jonah was on? Why was it coming? Because it said God sent this terrible storm and it was, it, it was going to, they were all going to perish, right? They're looking for somebody to blame. They are looking for well, not just someone. They they want a, they want the true one. But evidently, you know, you see this through the Bible. God God uses this or blesses this um, when when they divided the land. Israel inherited the land. Joshua brought them into the promised land. Of course, there's twelve tribes, right? How did they decide? where the boundaries were from for this tribe and then the next tribe and the next tribe. So what they did first, they drew all the boundaries They said to try to make it even, and then they cast lots. They said, oh, look, the tribe of Judah gets this. The tribe of, you know, right? And, and Naphtali gets this part, and God blessed it. And that's how they inherited their, their portion of the land. <clears throat> Uh, and assigning uh, individual inheritances in Israel, they casted lots. When uh, uh, they were electing a king, they cast lots. Well, you would think there would be a better way. But God blessed this method. In fact, I mean, if this seems superstitious, do you know, you remember how many, how many apostles were there? Twelve. Twelve. And then one of them, right? One of them hung himself. Judas. He hung himself? He hung himself after he betrayed Jesus, yes. Well, he had to be, his office had to be replaced. The apostles had a big meeting and said, someone's got to take his place. So there was qualified individuals, but how did they choose who would be the apostle? They cast lots. You see it in the book of Acts. So God blessed it there. What's interesting is after the, um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you never see the reference of casting lots again. I think what it meant, uh, what that means, or God's telling us is it's better to be led by the Spirit than to cast lots. Do you remember when we talked about Gideon and he did that thing with the fleece? He said, he put it underground. He said, if, if, it's, uh, if I wake up and it's damp on the fleece and it's, or the dew's on the fleece and it's not on the grass, then I know it's from you. You got a 50-50 chance when you do that with God, right? God better be, be answering. And he did it twice. He reversed it, if you remember. Soldiers cast lots at the foot of the cross for Jesus' yeah, garments. Yeah. Oh yeah, they cast lots for his garments. Yeah, yeah. First gambling table. So some of the soldiers liked him, right? Well, they wanted his clothes. <clears throat> they want. They wanted. They wanted the memorabilia. It was worth something. Because it would. Yeah. I mean, if you had one of the nails that were driven into Jesus. How much would that be worth today? Do you, do you know who Jonathan was? We talked about Jonathan in previous messages. Jonathan was David's friend, right? What, who, what was he? His best friend. His best friend and whose son, who, who son? Saul's son. So the king's son, the prince, the one who should have sat on the throne instead of David was his best friend. So when jo- Jonathan, it, it, Jonathan's death kind of went like this. Saul made a, a stupid vow and said if anyone eats uh, or eats or drinks anything uh, uh, before uh, we conquer, and I forget what the en- who the enemy was, if it was yeah. Philistine, I don't remember, but um, it was his son that did it. And so his son ended up losing his life because... Saul actually cursed him, and uh, but the the way the way they determined because at first they had all this 
negative stuff coming upon them. And so Saul's like, well, who sinned? And nobody would admit it. Well, Jonathan wasn't there. He was out on, on some maneuver or some military thing. And so they began to cast lots. And the lot came on Jonathan. So you, could, you probably got a couple million people there. And God isolated Jonathan by blessing the casting of lots. So this is not strange. Uh, we talk about, about Matthias' replacement for Judas. Uh, the Day of Atonement. There was the Day of Atonement was probably one, uh, probably the most important. Maybe it was probably more important than the Passover. The Day of Atonement happened once a year, and there was two goats. Remember, there was a scapegoat who the priest would put this put his hands on and, and pronounce the sins of all trespasses of all Israel upon, and then the other one would be killed. Well, how did they choose which one of the two would be killed and which one would be set free? Cast in lots. Okay? So you can see it. You see it all the way through. So it's not strange. It's not superstition. It's not some, you know, mythological thing. Also, do you remember in, when, when they did, uh, uh, have the, the land of inheritance, they, they, they chose the cities of refuge. And there were cities all over. And when we talk about cities, they weren't these great big, like Chicago, you know, uh, or even Carpentersville. <laughs> it probably weren't as big as Carpentersville. But uh, throughout the whole land, they chose locations. Well, how did they choose them? They cast lots. And that's how they came up with it. So it's, it's biblical. It's, you see it all the time. But I don't, think, I don't think we're supposed to do that today. I don't, I don't think we're supposed to cast lots for things. I think we're supposed to pray and believe God. You know, now, if you want to cast lots, if you, you got maybe you got two job offers, and so the easiest way to do it is say, "Heads, I go over there; <laughs> tails, I go over there." That's casting lots, right? Okay, so he said, "Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us." So they cast lots, and lot fell on Jonah. So it worked, and Jonah was pointed at; he was the guilty one. And then said they to him, "Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? Or where did you come from? What is what? Is, who are you? What, tell me something about you. Well, what is your job?" And why? What country did you come from? What people are you from? And so Jonah is like, okay, they found me, right? And he says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. <laughs> now, that fear of the Lord must have jumped into him after the storm, because when God told him to go, he went the other direction, right? So he said, and I fear the Lord. He's almost like trying to get in good with God now, right? He said, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry ground. He's almost speaking positive affirmations on the, that, that he can control the weather or something. God, you know, my God's the one who can control. The, and all of that was true. But it looks like he, you know, he, he was fessing up to that he was the guilty party and he, he was renewing his position. He thought he felt, I think, with, uh, with God. Of course, he's talking to a bunch of uh, pagans or, or Gentiles and, and he knows that they don't know the true God. So verse 10, Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And so that's why they're like, they're all afraid. And they're like, oh my God, you serve this God who made the, the sea, the heavens, the earth. And you ran from him? And you got on our boat? And you endangered all of us? And now we're all going to perish because of you. And verse 11, they said to him, what shall we do to you? I mean, I know what I would do. <laughs> He'd be overboard, <laughs> right? But they were afraid to do that because he said here that he serves God. He said, I, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. And they're like, what are we going to do? This, this is the prophet of God. 
We don't want to kill him and make God, you know, maybe God will be, be more angrier. In verse 11, they said, what shall we do to you? And he said, that the sea, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm to us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous, which is kind of we brought out before, right? So they're saying, well, what can we do? What, what do you recommend that we do to get us out of this situation so we don't all perish? And jo- so Jonah says to them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. And that's big of Jonah. To find, to admit, hey, all this is coming upon you for me. I, I think he had a little thought of, you know, because I felt, because I ran away from God, I don't want all these people to die because of my sin. Just take me, throw me into the sea. Now, he has no idea what's going to happen. He's probably still thinking, at least if you throw me to sea, I don't have to go to Nineveh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that the sea may be calm. calm or he says, uh, take me up, cast me into the sea, verse 12. Uh, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know, not I think, but I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now, how many, how many have sinned? And when the judgment of God comes upon you, you know, you know what you did. You know why you, you know, you're getting chastised, right? He knows, he knows why this came. And he tells him, just throw me overboard. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. So after he tells him, here's, you know, here's what you do. Throw me overboard. And then the the sea will calm down. And they, and they said, uh, no, we're, we're going to just row hard. You can't get out of the judgment of God because you're rowing harder, right? You tell people, you know, in, I can see in the, in the last days after the church is wrapped and, and this, the uh, meteors are falling, stars are falling from the sky and the earthquakes and people are going to try harder. Can't do anything. You're, it's too late, right? So you don't want to be around for the judgment. I guess that's a, that's a point we can see here. So verse 14, no, verse 13, they, they rode harder to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was temptuous against them. So in other words, all of their work was worthless. And so then they decided, well, we better do what he says before we all die. So wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, we, we beseech thee, O Lord. And that's a way of saying, we beg you. You know, they're, they're all pleading. We beg you, Lord. Uh, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it has pleased thee. And now they're all praying to God, the real God. Before, they were all praying to their own God. Now they're all calling, calling out the Jonas God because they know he, he told them, my God's the one that's doing this. And they're all, you know, trying to be to placate God there. So verse 15, so they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Like, it doesn't say immediately, but I think you could probably, you know, read that into it. It's like Jonah said, as soon as you do it, it'll become, the sea will become calm, the storm will come, become calm, and that's exactly what happened, right? They threw him overboard, and God said, okay, I got, got done what I was going to do. I don't want to kill these people. So it ceased from a raging, verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Well, that's a good thing. I wonder how many of them actually turned to the God of Jonah. And just, you know, to, to kept that. Because here they, they feared him exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And they made vows to him. Now, obviously, they did all these things. And they, they weren't, they didn't know what they were doing. They're doing it in a pagan way. But they're really try, trying to get connected to, to Jonah's God here. And they made these vows. Verse 17 now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And that's why I said it's hard to swallow. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now go to uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. And in Matthew, we've got some, I've got some letters in red. So what does that tell me? We're going to see Jesus talking, right? 
You know, do, you, do you know, it was a long time before I realized why the, why the letters were... That's why I'm, I'm, I'm asking you if you know. Because when I... I mean, it was, it was a long time before I realized, because I, nobody, I didn't have anybody to guide me. I just had the, you know, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit in the book to guide me into the truth. I didn't really have anybody that, was, that knew anything. So uh, it takes time, you know, it takes time to grow. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. In other words, show us a sign. Do you notice they called, the Pharisees called Jesus master? Those hypocrites. They're they're just trying to act like they believe in him or that they accept that he's a prophet. They don't. I mean, these are the same guys who want to kill him, right? So they say, well, let's show us a sign. And they're probably thinking, now, what's what's he going to do? And the goofy thing is, he heals people with blind eyes. He heals people with lame, you know, lame arms and legs. And he, he, he resurrects people from the dead. And these guys say, show us a sign. And they still don't believe. <laughs> I mean, come on. Now, how many, thi- how many times has people done, or God done things in Christians' lives, and then you wonder, you know, something else happens to them, and they're so down in the dumps, and you're like... Don't you remember the last time when God, and they don't, they don't have any memory. And actually, that's one of the things we're supposed to do. We're supposed to remember our trials and the way God delivered us. And that helps us in the next trial. After they went over to the promised land, they did that too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, we, I think we talked about when the ark went across, we talked about them setting up that. And so right here, I'm just before we go on to this, uh, the words of Jesus, I want to bring up reasons why Christians suffer various trials in this life. Now, I can't point to the Scripture for all these. These are not reasons that, uh, you know, that I, that I came up with. These are just reasons that some of the theologians say these are the reasons Christians suffer. Various trials. You, you, might, you might like to know these. So the first one they have is to glorify God. In other words, God will have you. Now I'm saying I'm not saying this. I'm, this is what this is what the the masses are saying. That teach on on this. They say uh, the the first re- major reason you have trials is to glorify God. Another one, and we talked about this uh, last week and probably the week before, in fact, uh, several times probably through the book of Hebrews, we, we can be disciplined when we have sin that we know about. When we, sin, when we have sin and we refuse to do something about it, there comes a time where you may get a spanking from God. And that spanking... Let's put it this way. You don't really want to have that done. Okay? Uh, I think about a spanking that my father would do, but he didn't have uh, uh, little pins in his belt. Could you imagine if God takes off his big belt? <laughs> okay, so pre- uh, he may do it not, not just to discipline us for known sin, but to prevent us from falling into sin. Maybe he's trying to protect us because he knows if we go forward with this path that we're on and he doesn't do something, we're going to fall right into sin down the road. We're going to fall away. Maybe we're going to fall away from the church. Maybe we're going to fall away from uh, whatever. So God tries to prevent us. So he sends a trial in our life. And the trial kind of gets us diverted. Maybe we knew we weren't supposed to be on the path we were. So God sends a trial, and finally, through the trial, we get ourselves straightened out. We call upon God, and we, we get straightened out. And, uh, to keep us safe from pride is another reason for trial. Uh, to help build a faith that stands firm in adversity. How many have had adversity and trials, trials and adversity in their life? And when you and everybody does, and when you come through it, when you when you believe God, when you trust God, when God brings you through it, next time you go through, you're stronger. 
Yeah. If you remember it, right? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta remember it. Supposed to learn from it. Uh, another, another reason we may have trials is to cause spiritual growth. I concluded a long time ago that a lot of Christians don't seem to want to grow. And I guess sometimes God has to send trials into their life to, to make them grow. We get, comfortable. we get too comfortable. Yeah, exactly. And it's very common, right? It's very common uh, to teach obedience and discipline. Uh, could be ch- uh, ch- ch- when I say discipline, the word chastisement is probably should stand out uh, to to equip us to comfort others. Have you ever heard that that God maybe brought you through this situation because now you know somebody else is going through the same thing? I mean, it happens a lot with uh, you know. In fact, uh, very successful in the world the world where you have people that are uh, they're hooked on drugs. And then you have somebody that's, that has pulled through it, and then they become a help to these other, others to get them up. They know all about, you're going to have to go through this. You're, you're going to have to go through detox. You're going to, you're right? But, but that's just one example. Uh, what, what if, uh, well, I, I don't want to get into specifics there, uh, but... Uh, so I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there uh, to uh, to prove the reality of Christ in us. Sometimes trials might come on our life just so we know that God has delivered us, that God is there, God has walked through it with us. Remember, He says, "I shall never leave you nor forsake you." Right? And it's good to know when something happens that there's a reality that Christ is is where He said He would be, right in us. And the last one that I have, it's kind of interesting, but it is biblical. For you might go through trials for the testimony to the angels. Did you realize the Bible says that the angels are all watching the members of the church to learn about God? To learn about His character, to learn about His love, to learn about His judgment, to learn about all the attributes of God, because... They didn't have the same situation that you have. They were just made. God says, spoke them into existence. They were made before we were made. But to none of them did He say, Thou art my Son. You know, it's, it's amazing that God says that to you. Thou art my Son. Jesus is, Jesus is the Son of God. He was man. But he was the son of God, right, in the flesh. And because of him, we can become sons of God or daughters of God, if you will, right? And the angels learn from us. So I just thought I would inject that. But let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 here. And remember, the Pharisees just asked Jesus to show them a sign. So a sign, a sign is a sign is show us something that would would prove to us, yeah. right? Show us some proof. Yeah. And like I said, he's already done all these miracles. He turned her water into wine. He walks on the water, right? Show us a sign. <laughs> An evil and adulterous generation. Or Jesus said, answered, and he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. How many people do you know or have you heard about that call themselves Christians, but they're looking for some sort of sign? Yeah. They don't care what it is. I mean, if, if at night all of a sudden a bright light appeared on their, in their ceiling or something, they would go, oh, it's a sign, right? And it happens to be the, the guy outside turned his headlights on, you know? But, I mean, that's how easy things can happen. I, there, there's people that uh, worship uh, statues, and, and uh, they say, well, the statue comes to life. That's a sign. And it, it, signs are not necessarily from God, Right? And you see Jesus' word. He said, evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it. 
wait a minute. If God is doing all these signs, then you just negated what Jesus said because he said no sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonas. And it says Jonas, that's Jonah. Okay, in Greek it, it, it changes a little and so our translation came out of Greek. What's it? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable basing my life on a, rolling the dice, you know. But then I've never been a very good gambler, so maybe, maybe every time you roll the dice, you win, so go for it, you know. I even rolled the dice when I played games with my grandson and I lost, so. <laughs> you know, do you ever play that game Risk, where, where you're trying to take over the world, and you, got, you roll five dice? My grandson would just beat me all the time. <laughs> beat me all the time. He'd conquer me. And he was young, and now today he's got strategy plus luck. So, some people are more luckier than others. But I, I, yeah, I wouldn't do the sign, the, the uh, um, cast lots for anything, for any decision. But uh, as Jonah, now Jesus said that J- Jonah is the sign that he will give to this generation, right? That means that J- Jesus is saying. Jonah, the story of Jonah is true. Regardless of what everybody's telling you out there, saying, well, there's no way it could be true. Jesus said, it is true. And he said, and not only is it true, he's the sign. Now, what did, what, we, we, we talked about how Jesus talked about four prophets. He singled out four prophets. We said, Jonah is in some good company, Right? But now, he didn't say Isaiah was a sign. He didn't say Elijah or Elisha was the sign. He said Jonah is the sign. He took one of the minor prophets and he exalted him to such a high place. This book, this book of Jonah, which people laugh about, this is one, this is one of the most sacred, most, most precious things because Jesus said that's the sign. If you believe Jonah, you'll believe this. Well, what was he talking about? What, what's the sign? He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's very simple. Right. And, you know, that's actually the whole second chapter talks about, of Jonah talks about um, him being in the, in the belly of the whale. Just uh, incidentally, the word there for whale is actually not... It could be whale. But there's nothing saying that it has to be a whale. There are people who will critique this story and say there's no way because... I, something about the whale's esophagus or something, I don't know. They said there, there's no way the whale could actually have done this. I don't know where they're coming from. But they got a big mouth, yeah. But but here's the thing the the word act, the word that they translate whale actually is uh, uh, it means some type of great sea fish great great being large exceedingly large or it could even be a sea serpent that's all we know now I think it's a, I, I don't think I think it's one of a kind I don't think we look and say oh you must be the kind that swallowed Jonah. In fact, I think it's still out there somewhere. I don't think it died. What? Jonah's not in it. Nessie, the Loch Ness monster. It might be Nessie. That's, that's, that's true. Wouldn't that be cool if that came out, that it was the Loch Ness monster? So anyway, so Jonah, but so Jonah is in the belly of this creature, which is this enormous, great fish. And the uh, the word here for uh, for whale, or actually the the word in uh, uh, the Old Testament under Jonah was it wasn't whale; it was dag. Now, do you remember when we talked about a god whose name started with dag? Dagon, Dagon. right? 
In fact, we talk about he was he was the, the main god of the Philistines. Well, he was the main god of the Assyrians also. And it's almost ironic that to the people who believe in the fish god, that God's going to do all this stuff with this fish and send this prophet who gets thrown up, vomited up to go deliver them, right? Just something to, uh, to be aware of. So Jonah was three days, three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Was the Son of Man in the heart of the earth three days and three nights? Now, I don't know how it says so. But I don't know how you go from Good Friday to Sunday morning and get three out of it. I don't know. Three, 24, that's 72 hours, right? I don't know how, how you could possibly arrive at that conclusion. So I, I don't really believe in that. Good Friday is good that, Friday yeah, it was, a Good Friday was not Good Friday. That's tradition. Wednesday. Tradition says that. So you've got to be careful because over 2,000 years of Christianity, we've adopted a lot of things that don't kind of line up with the Word. And so many people don't care. Now, the, one of the main reasons, the Catholic Church doesn't really think the Bible is the Word of God. They don't think it's inspired. They think what's more important is tradition. So if tradition says it was Friday through Sunday, then that's what's important. And if they say, well, what, it's supposed to be three days, they'll say Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, but it was night, morning. So, and I, I, I don't want to go there. I'm just saying if it says he, was in, he would be three days and three nights, and he said it's just going to be just like Jonah. That's the sign. In other words, if you, if you don't believe, this is the sign. This is the only sign I'm going to give to you people, and I'll be in there three days and three nights, and then I'll rise from the dead. And if you don't believe that, you might as well just close the book. You got, I mean, that's, that's the one thing you got to believe. Muslims say that they believe that Jesus is a prophet. But did you know Muslims do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Muslims do not believe he was crucified. But they think they're, they're okay. They think, well, we believe in Jesus, so we've got Jesus, plus we got Mohammed. So, you know, we're okay. But it's not true. They don't believe in the three days and the three nights. Jonah was the sign. We know, and, and by saying it, if Jesus says this is the sign, Jonah is the sign, then he must be putting his stamp of approval on that story. And that tells me, I mean, for me, I believed it was true in the first place. Because it's, like you said, it's in the Bible, right? But when Jesus kind of puts his stamp of approval on something and says this is the way it is, it's got to be true. Especially, but you see the significant place that he puts on this three days and three nights. That's the sign. And now he, he brings up this next thing. He's, he's saying, if you, don't, if you don't believe in what I'm telling you about the three days and the three nights, if you reject this gospel, he said the, in verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. In other words, when Jonah went and preached, they believed. Jesus did all these miracles. He rises from the dead. They still don't believe. Then the apostles do all these miracles in the name of Jesus, and people still don't believe. What's wrong? I don't. What's wrong with us? The devil's got us, right? The devil. Devil's got us. Now I'm not saying devil got us, but devil's got the world. It's hard for people. I, I know. I'm sure you all have experienced. There's people that would like to believe, and for some reason. They can't. And I don't know what's holding them back. I don't know what it is. Because when I decided that I was going to follow Christ, there was no problem. Right? But I, but I believed it. 
So I, I think believing the word is, is uh, very important. How many people did we say were living in Nineveh? You remember? How many? 650,000. Right? 650,000. Every one of them repented. Right? Now we haven't gotten there and yet, but look what it said. He said, these men of Nineveh shall rise in ju- judgment against this generation. And it's including us in this generation. Mm-hmm. They, 650,000 people are going to stand up and point at you. Why didn't you believe? No. You had the whole Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah. How could you not believe? Not Is that amazing? I think it's amazing. I mean, in fact, that's one of the... the I, I think there's 10 miracles in Jonah, and that's one of them, that 650,000 people repented by the, the message of a prophet who didn't even want to go. But God has a way <laughs> of shaping us, doesn't He? And then there's one more thing here in verse 42. He also says, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth. They're talking about the Queen of Sheba. The uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And you know, Jesus was called the Word. Wasn't he? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And he's saying a greater than Solomon is here. He's talking about referring to himself. He said, and the Queen of Sheba will rise up in judgment because she, she went way out of her way just to hear Solomon speak. How many people are going out of their way to hear what's in the Word of God? All over this country. It used to be a whole lot better. But people now, people nowadays, they don't care. They don't, they don't care what the Word of God says. The Word of God, the 66 books of the Bible, that's God's wisdom. That's everything God thought was important enough to give you. I actually like what the the, what the Muslims say about this, that when they talk about the Quran, they say, if it's not in the Quran, God knew it wasn't that important. In fact, a Muslim does not, a Muslim does not say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. But yet you got all these Christians saying, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. How come the true people don't believe and the false ones do? What kind of witness is that? And you know, question, God doesn't have a problem with questioning. No. no. If, he, if he did, I wouldn't even be here because I questioned everything. Well, that's how you learn. Yeah, that's how you learn. Exactly. I, I, don't, I don't know that I ever shared this testimony with you, but when I first started reading the Bible, I was in the service, and my roommate was actually a Christian. And so he got me to to uh, start reading the New Testament. I think he gave me a copy of New Testament and paperback. So I read in Matthew. I read through Matthew. I thought, well, that was interesting. I, I have no clue what it's about. You know, I, I never, and I saw probably a movie about Jesus, but it's not the same as reading the gospel. Right. So I read that first book. Then I read the, the uh, Mark, right? And I was like, seems like a lot of repeating. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, what kind of a book is this? <laughs> chapter one is just like chapter two. <laughs> and then I get into Luke. <laughs> and you know, yeah. now I'm in, oh my goodness, right? Yeah. It's the same chapter. Copycats. It's like, yeah, they're all copycats. <laughs> And actually, that's one of the indictments that the, the world out there says that, the, you know, they, they all copied off each other. Uh, no, it's not you true. Had the New Testament. I had the New Testament, yeah. Oh, it was just the New Testament? I, all I had was the New Testament oh. at the time, yeah. So, so then I got into John. And I read through John. I was determined. I'm going to get through this, right? So I read through John. I was like, 
Well, John's a lot different. Yes. You know, there's, there's not any overlap with John. So I got into the book of Acts. And I came to Peter talking about that, those animals on that sheet that came down. And he tells that story like three times. And when I read it the third time, I took my Bible and threw it across the room. I said, this is the most ridiculous book I've ever seen in my life. I'm not reading that. And it took me so many years before I came back. That's kind of like Jonah. You know, God's trying to pull me in the right direction. And here I take His precious Word and fling it across across the room because He's repeating Himself. Well, maybe He was repeating and saying things three times because I needed to hear it three times. Maybe that's it, right? But aren't you glad? I was thinking about that, about Jonah. Jonah was told to do something. The word, of the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and then he refused to do it. But you know what? The Word of the Lord comes back to Jonah. Aren't you glad that it came back to Jonah? That, or we wouldn't have the story of Jonah. We wouldn't have had the three days and the three nights as a sign. But aren't you glad when you did that, that God, the Word of God, came back to you. God didn't give up. God, I mean, if I was God and somebody did that, my precious Word, that my son blood, I would have said, okay, you're in hell, buddy. At least, if you're not going to hell, you're going to purgatory. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's no purgatory. <laughs> hell is worse. <laughs>